So let's start with the basics. I mean, helicopters have been a thing for many, many years. Uh, your aircraft also flies vertically and takes off vertically. What makes it different? And I think we have a video to help illustrate this point. Awesome, let's see the video. All right, so what we're developing is an all-electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. It takes off like a helicopter, so straight up, runway independent, but it can convert to flying like an airplane. And this is really enabled by a number of advances that have happened over the last 20 years. So we're talking about the way uh, software and electronics and computers have advanced to let you make really efficient electric motors, as well as all of the, the advancements in batteries and powertrains that let electric vehicles in general on the ground or in other contexts work. So all of this can be put together to kind of radically rethink how do you do vertical lift. And this aircraft uh, flying right behind us on the screen is the result of that. It is all electric. It has uh, six electric motors um, that are actually direct drive, so no gearboxes, so minimal moving parts. And, uh, and these propellers attached to those motors can point up to take off like a helicopter and then tilt forward and fly like an airplane. And this lets us actually design that powertrain for incredibly low noise um, and then really good operating costs, which together we think opens up the air taxi market to make it much more practical for lots of people. Let's talk about that market on the commercial side a little bit. What is the vision for a business around this aircraft? So we want to deploy these as air taxis. So the, the vision is really basic, actually. You open up Uber on your phone. Uber is one of our investors and commercial go-to-market partners. And you select a, a ride. Instead of taking an Uber Black or an Uber X, you'd pick a Joby. We also will have our own app that you can open up and just take a Joby right away. So, um, and then a car will come and get you, take you to the nearest uh, takeoff and landing spot. And other people will be arriving just in time. We'll fill the seats that way, dynamically on demand. And the aircraft will take off. If you're in lower Manhattan, seven minutes to the airport, to JFK, land as close to the terminal as you can. We're also partnered with Delta, get you right onto your flight. And uh, instead of taking an hour and a half waiting in traffic, uh, uh, driving through, uh, through Long Island, you can get there in seven, eight minutes. Now, you mentioned aircraft noise. I lived in New York City for about a decade. Uh, helicopter noise is constant and annoying, and people hate it. How do you convince people that this is a good thing for, for the com community, basically, right? Well, you this have moment? to basically show this, right? Yeah. And, or actually, you have, to, you have to hear it for yourself. And so we actually went to New York City uh, back at the end of 2023, and uh, we did a, a press conference with the, with the mayor there, actually, down at the lower Manhattan heliport, and we flew one of our aircraft. And we, just, we invited the community out to see it and to hear it, and people actually asked our CEO to stop speaking during the press conference so they could hear it better because it was so quiet. So that was, uh, was kind of cool. And it's really a, a remarkable technology. It's a lot of work. Electric just doesn't get you uh, uh, low noise for free. You actually have to do really hard design work that's enabled by this new technology. But we're pretty excited with what we've uh, put together. When it's fly taking off and landing uh, 300 feet away, 65 dB, so it means we could have this conversation and not raise our voice um, during takeoff and landing, which is the loudest phase. When it's flying overhead in airplane mode, 45 dB at a 1,500 feet, this means you won't hear it in an urban environment. It's basically silent if it's flying overhead. This being a defense event, uh, you've worked with the Defense Department on various projects. What have you learned through those projects that might apply to your commercial operations? Yeah, we've been really fortunate to have uh, the uh, amazing partners uh, in, on the defense side of things. So we worked with DIU, um, or DIU-X, I think it was at the time, uh, very early on to do some of our early flight testing and uh, development work in a way that uh, supported what we were doing. Um, the, the defense partners have been really excited to see what this, how this commercial tech can actually have applications um, in, in, uh, in, in different contexts within the, the defense side of things. And so we've looked at things like on-base logistics. We've looked at other types of, uh, of use cases that are just a direct application of this technology that we're developing. We've also worked with, uh, so we've been working with AFWorks and Agility Prime uh, primarily over the last few years. We've done work on um, looking at hybridization as well, for example. So we actually put together, took one of our older prototypes, we converted it to a, a hydrogen hybrid uh, aircraft. So we actually uh, took, took the seats out, put a big fuel tank in and a fuel cell, just a tech demonstrator. But we did that conversion uh, in about six weeks, actually, and then went out and flew um, almost 600 miles in terms of a demonstration flight just to show what that hybridization tech uh, can do for this type of aircraft. Now, my understanding is that commercially, as far as commercial operations go, you're a little bit further along in Dubai than you are in the US. Can you speak to why that is and what you're learning by working in that, in that area? 
Yeah, so we were uh, really fortunate to be able to, to strike a partnership with the, the Road Transport Authority in Dubai. So it's basically the transportation regulator in Dubai um, to be able to uh, work together with them and be the air taxi provider for the city and the, the, the emirate of Dubai um, once we were able to start a commercial launch. And so what part of that is that we're working with the, the, the Gulf regulators, the GCAA, which is essentially the FAA for the, United, uh, the UAE. And, um, and what they're doing is taking the FAA work and then kind of accelerating some of the final approvals on it that uh, could get us to a, an initial commercial authorization as soon as possible. And so that's uh, been a great collaboration so far. They're very forward leaning. They really wanna work um, collaboratively to, uh, to, to be, they really wanna be first in terms of, of getting uh, this technology out into the market. And so uh, we're working with them very closely. Now, speaking of the FAA, you know, integrating a, an entirely new kind of aircraft into the American airspace is complicated and hard and takes a long time. How far along are you in that process? And also, new boss of the FAA, new boss for the FAA. Um, how is that you know, interaction going so far? Yeah, so the FAA has been a, a really collaborative partner. So we've been working with the FAA since, uh, we actually, I think, got the, formally started working with the FAA back in 2020 in terms of the, starting to work on the certification basis for this entirely new class, class of aircraft. Um, we've, we've worked together to define out all of the key, to the key aspects of how this aircraft is, is regulated and, and certified. The final piece of the puzzle um, uh, went to a final rule last year. Uh, it was called the SFAR, so the Special uh, Regulation Around Pilot and operation rules uh, for this class of aircraft um, because of the way the FAA is categorizing it for, um, for actually certification. So we've been, been very uh, pleased with that and we're just looking forward to continuing to do that deep work and see that relationship accelerate and, and getting through all of the now myriad of testing that we're doing um, to get to that type certification, which is really this design certification where we have to show that every aspect of our design meets the safety regulations and we have to do all of the testing for every little bit of it. Um, and the FAA has to be alongside with that to, uh, to get all of that work done. Now the testing and, the re and all that is one thing, actually convincing people to get on this new aircraft yeah. is a whole different challenge. How are you thinking about approaching that in terms of getting people to agree, okay, yeah, this is a safe new aircraft to fly on? Well, I mean, really getting to that, getting to the type certification and being able to launch commercially is, is that fundamental first step um, because there's, a, there's such a, uh, there's a reason why aviation is, is regulated the way it is and, uh, and why people are confident getting onto aircraft to, to fly every day, right? And so that's a really critical piece of this. At the same time, uh, we want to start to do more of the kind of things that, that we did in New York City, where we actually took one of our aircraft out there, we flew that aircraft, we let people see it, we let people hear it, um, and we'll be doing more and more of that. We actually put one of our mock-ups um, at just last week, I think it was last week, <laughs> we had it at the California Science Center down in LA. And so we had one of our mock-ups on display there, and we brought a bunch of kids in to, uh, to, uh, to see a movie that uh, was made on the IMAX that we were featured in as well. And uh, it's a, there's a, a number of these steps where we start to broaden the awareness in the community as this technology gets closer and closer to commercial launch. Um, to help people be familiar with it and really see how this can benefit their lives um, and kind of get everyone to understand that vision of this rapid uh, way to get around that is not constrained by the traffic and the congestion that we deal with every day on the ground. Now, the, uh, I want to ask about the tariff roller coaster this week. Uh, it's, yeah, it's part of my job to cover this stuff and to know what's happening. And man, it's been a hard week to understand anything that's going on right now. Um, as a company that, you know, you're, I'm sure you have foreign suppliers and that sort of thing, how worried are you? How anxious does it make you feel about you're not sure what something's going to cost in the next week or hour? So one of the things that we've done a little bit differently than others in our industry is we've really leaned on vertical integration. So we build nearly everything ourselves. So actually, I have right here this pocket. Um, this, for example, is one of our flight computers. So this is a, we have three of these in our aircraft. This is the brain, basically, um, you know, smaller than a cell phone, similar chips um, for, for what's in there. And the, the power of our vertical integration is that we can dial in and tailor what we need um, and we can then build it ourselves and we really control our supply chain uh, pretty deeply as a result. So we haven't seen uh, negative effects right now, um, but obviously we're, we're care carefully monitoring on a, on a you know, hour by hour basis as to uh, what's happening and, and what, how things will play out down the road. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, this goes back to the regulatory issue a little bit, but you know, Colin mentioned earlier the tragic crash, the midair here you know, a few months ago. Um, it's, airspace is busy. How are you sort of figuring out how do you integrate this uh, you know, new aircraft into airspace that's already you know, very congested? We'll so say. yeah, so we, we are, um, 
taking a very pragmatic approach to how we've designed this aircraft. This, the aircraft is, is designed to be piloted by commercially rated pilots, which is why we needed those, those special rules to be done from the FAA for how do you train pilots and how do you operate these aircraft integrated into the airspace system. So it flies, uh, it integrates just like any other uh, helicopter or small aircraft would, uh, would integrate into the airspace. We actually have been doing studies then with both with NASA as well as working with FAA and the Tech Center up in Atlantic City um, on how do you think about you know, future integrations into the airspace system. We did a, a study with NASA, um, it was the end of 23 as well, we published it as a paper in 24, where uh, we looked at, we brought in, we used the, NASA's got a, a, a ATC simulator basically, it's a you know, big center with like screens and brought in retired FAA controllers and ran a multi-day simulations around uh, different scenarios um, in a busy Class B airspace. We used Dallas-Fort Worth area as the uh, example. How do you integrate um, into the airspace in this system and how, what's the capacity? How do you, you know, if you just use existing procedures and, and you know, the staff the helicopter position um, in the tower, and then if you inc introduce incremental changes, like very small additional kind of procedures, how does that affect capacity overall? I'm really pleased with the results that it shows there's a lot of things you can do with just procedures and, uh, and that, that have quite a lot of capacity to support this type of uh, traffic in a uh, typical busy, busy Metroplex. Eric, we'll have to leave the conversation there. Thank you so much for your time. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you.